be very, very quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Dennis Gebhardt here with Guru Nation. Glad to see you and welcome you back to Rabbit Trail one more time. I'm here with my guest, Max Manzano from Boston, Massachusetts. Max, how are you doing this morning, man? I'm all right. How are you, Dennis? I'm great. I'm great. We got through the holiday okay. And yeah. so now we're looking to, you know, power into 2021. Um, and I hope everybody is uh, ready for that. I mean, it, we're only just a few days into the new year. And uh, hopefully you're setting plans and uh, trying to get things together so that 2021 <laughs> will make up for the last six months of 2020. Ooh. Oh, I saw a meme the other day where <laughs> a guy had a trash bag and he was holding his nose and on the bag, it was 2020, <laughs> the year he was dumping it, because uh, well, it was uh, quite a challenge for us. The bar is set pretty low, so hopefully we it can, is. We can uh, <laughs> yes. extend beyond it. Yes. So let's take our first uh, little soiree into the world of hair color here today. As for those of you that are watching today, this is your first time. Let me tell you a little bit about rabbit trails. Um, the reason we call this program Rabbit Trails is because I'm sure you've heard it used in conversation before where people get into these lengthy conversations in our business uh, and someone will mention one subject and then everybody heads down that direction and we call it going down a rabbit trail or a rabbit hole. And um, there's a lot of rabbit trails in the world of hair color, especially a lot of different, a lot of opinions and a lot of assumptions with just a spoonful of science. So for Max and I, we try to chase down the truths and give some clarity to you, the salon professional, so that you're able to take what the information we give to you and use it the way it will work for you the best. So today is about, again, giving you information, kind of getting some clarity on some of the confusion that is in our industry. Because I don't know about you, Max, but when I go on social media, <laughs> I walk away sometimes I have a migraine <laughs> because Ooh, I go, are you kidding me? People really believe that stuff. Um, so we're going to just kind of uh, approach some things very uh, a little bit differently and uh, kind of give you some in input on that. Uh, today, I think what we need to talk about, first of all, especially if you're new to this industry, uh, it's kind of how we got here in with hair color, especially, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and uh, I thought I'd started in this industry in the middle of its golden years, but actually I was there in the beginning. I had an epiphany that I was one of the ones that were there in the beginning and the start of it. And uh, here we are. Uh, and color is still the leading service in salons across America. Um, it generates the most amount of revenue for salon professionals. And yet it's still, in many cases, the most misunderstood service that we participate in. So Max, when did you start into the industry? Well, I uh, first enrolled in beauty school it, in about 1996. Uh -huh. So we were just kind of moving out of the perm era and into the color era. Ah, yes. So that's kind of where the, the focus was in my own personal schooling. And then, you right. know, af after school, I basically went on to specialize in hair color. Right, great. Well, you know, I started when there was only a few hair color companies even in the industry, even in the business here in the United States. I think uh, there was Wella, there was Clairol, there was Redken Amino Color. And I think that was about it until the late 70s. And then in the late 70s, we had the European invasion. And it started in Italy with a color manufacturer named Inner Cosmos, which produced color for a lot of color companies. And um, so that we started bringing color in from there. We brought color in from uh, Goldwell came in from Germany. We had uh, several other of the cream, European cream hair colors come into the United States. And so that whole, gener that whole 
time of in our industry from let's say late 1979 until um until late 1980 there was a, a lot of there was liquid color and there was cream color in our business and uh cream color of course was the most popular because it was new you know how we are we love the newest thing but what i found is that when the Europeans came in and brought in cream color and they started teaching formulating, <laughs> their story on formulation was different than we had been teaching here in the United States. And, and what I find is a kind of ironic is here we are in 2021 and we still have schools of thought where the original uh, way of formulating, formulating for lift mostly because we know 75% of the color services that are done in salon are lifting or lightening processes. Um, they were using what is called the universal law of lift. And then when the European companies came in, they were using volume for lift. And there's a lot of salon professionals out there today are still confused uh, because they think one is you know they've been trained in one and they don't use the other and i think what would be great today is to kind of show them how you know you can really use both of them to get an effect they're, they're going to be different effects but you can implement both of them i think as a colorist we should be able to do that but uh that's where we started you know 79 uh wow it's hard to believe it's been that many years um but uh, that's the way we started in the business. So when you got in the business, there was some liquid color companies, but there were also a lot of cream hair color companies. Yes. Yes. And what is kind of interesting for the, the time period when I came in, they were the, the liquid color companies were still formulating that sort of original way. Right. And then the cream color companies were doing something different. And then you had a few kind of amalgamations that some cream companies were formulating, you know, that original way. Some liquid companies were formulating more the European way. And honestly, Dennis, for, for my class and like my sort of colleagues who are my beauty industry age, right. it was really confusing because number one, there were so many more choices and now you were hearing these sort of conflicting pieces of information because typically each sort of camp was like, our way is the right way. Right. That way is not right. Or right. our way is the more modern way. That's an right. old okay. school way. Right. And really until I started kind of doing stuff like experiments, swatches, right. heads of hair and putting it to the test, did I really see what worked and what worked for me? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I, and I think that's the biggest issue for a lot of people is they're confused over, you know, what is the right way? Well, there is no, there's no right way. There are many different ways to approach it, but you can use both depending on what you're trying to create. So right. here's what I find funny about formulating. I find, first of all, for me, I see three ways that people formulate in the salon. <laughs> One, they formulate by a recipe. You know, you know who they are, right? They have their recipes on a card. That client comes in, boom, and they have their favorite colors, no matter what. If you come in and ask for whatever color service you're asking for, they have their favorite colors that they use. Now, that's the way we started when we started doing hair color. We started by recipe. In fact, there was a weaving formula that we used in the 70s and all that weaving formula was a Clairol formula and it was one part topaz, one part moon gold and one part flax and blonde. So it didn't matter what color your hair was. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I would weave your hair with. And so we get caught up in that recipe, uh, that recipe box. In fact, manufacturers give you books with recipes in them. The only problem with that is you've got to find the right head for that recipe to give you what you're actually looking for. Exactly. And it's, 
I don't want to say it's doing yourself a disservice, but it's like, it's great to have formulas, but when you really know how to formulate, then you right. can create anything you want. Right. And I, th- I feel like throughout the years, a lot of companies have tried to almost, you know, for lack of a better term, dumb it down for hairdressers. So they don't, you know, have to formulate. And right. it's like, you, you know, like we, as people, I, I mean, I want to do my thinking myself, you know, right. like I right. want to know how to get there. Yes. Well, you know, because I work for a corporation, I had the opportunity to set in uh, some of those marketing meetings and I heard the way they talked about my, my industry, my fellow colleagues, and it really pissed me off, you know, because I said, no, 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 don't tell me that hairdressers are not smart. They are smart. I said, you have to give them that respect, but you have to give them the information in order to help them understand how to formulate. But that's why in salons today, people, you know, that's why they have small heart attacks when they go back to the back to get their favorite color and it's not there. They forgot to order it or someone else used the last tube of color and they just go, oh, what do I do? What do I do? I can't color her hair. Well, no, stop. (laughs) If you've got lots of shades to choose from, you should know what those shades are and how they look when you dye them out. Uh, That's why we always recommend, you know, I know Max, you do it. I always recommend to people who come to my classes or even the, my team that I work with, I say dye out swatches, do your dye out. So you know what these other colors are. So it eliminates the whole story about, recipes. And here's something to really think about. If my client comes in and gets her color done and she goes out for a month, I have no control on her behavior. So she might go and if it's a summertime, she might go to the beach, probably doesn't wear a hat, even though I might tell her to wear a hat. So she might leave me, you know, a a beautiful light brown. She might come back to me a blonde. Well, I can't use the same formula that I used on her before because now it's a different head of hair. Right. So recipes really can really get us into more problems than anything else. The second way is really scary. is when you use the person who you think is smarter than you and ask them to formulate for you. I call them the hair color quarterback, right? <laughs> you know, it makes people feel important because they're calling out formulas. I always imagine it being like a football game and they come back and they go, okay, walk by her chair. Don't let her know you're looking. (laughs) Come back and tell me what to use. So they come back and they go on a huddle and they go, you know, six in, 20 volume. They call out the play like a quarterback. (laughs) And it makes you feel good that people can, you know, respect your knowledge. But you have to also realize that if you're going to formulate for someone else, you've now accepted responsibility for the result. You know, that's one thing that always scared me when I was doing classes, when people would come up from the audience and they'd say, you know that formula you you used uh, three months ago? I used that formula and I'm thinking, oh crap, I don't remember that formula that I (laughs) used. Now they're gonna tell me, and her hair fell out or whatever because they just took the formula my friend, Kevin Champagne, who lives in New Orleans, um, he's a very funny guy. We were doing a show in New Orleans and um, he was coloring a model's hair and the lady in the front row raised her hand and she says, can you give me her formula? And he looked at her and he says, I'm sorry, I didn't know that you knew her. And she goes, I don't know her. Well, then why do you want her formula? Right? And I went, dude, you're very brave to say that, but it was true, right? Because we write down all these formulas and we don't do anything with them, you know, because we're having someone else formulate for us. Right. And it goes back to, and I'm sure there are a few hair color quarterbacks out there listening. Oh yes. There is the, the often or not often time, if that formula you give them goes sideways, Yep. It's your fault. Yeah, absolutely. And you get roped into having to fix it. That's right. 
And that's never a good time. I that's speak not. from experience. I see that on Facebook. I see people who, who they write and they go, I used brand X and this is the shade I used and it turned pink. Why? And I'm looking and I'm going, why would you even comment on this? Because I don't know what you did. I can't see the hair visually. And you want me to tell you why it turned pink? I don't know. Something happened. That's why it turned yeah. pink. <laughs> so, you know, they use the quarterback. And then there's the third way, which is they put everything in the bowl. <laughs> you know who they are, right? <laughs> they They're are the channeling. Ones. They're yes. channeling some they, spirit. They, they talk to themselves. Have you ever caught somebody in the back room? having a conversation with themselves about, well, you know, it might be a little warm, so I better put this in. Or I might have put you know, my mentor always said to me, he said, after the first two colors that you mix, everything else is emotion. Absolutely. <laughs> I worked with a girl that would stand in front of like the wall of color and stare and I'd be like, are you waiting for one of them to like start glowing <laughs> so you can pick it? Yes. You know, yeah. like. Right. It's, it, it's just funny. We're funny people. You know, I mean, I'm laughing at ourselves because we are funny people. My first hair color nightmare was because I didn't know anything about color. You know, when I got out of beauty school, I thought when someone came in and asked for ash blonde, I'd go back to the back and pull the bottle that said ash blonde on it. Yeah. And that's not actually the way it works. So I think the formulation is still a challenge for people. That's why I think people are afraid when they look at other brands of color, they're afraid to change brands. Don't you think? Because oh, they absolutely. go, I love this one. I know this brand. I don't know your brand. Well, what do you mean? It's just hair color. Well, well I have to learn your brand. You have to learn what? what you, it's still based on blue, red, and yellow. It's still based on a level system. Maybe just a couple of dye outs, you could probably color hair with it. But people are fearful of that, right? right? And because when hair color goes sideways, we don't blame ourselves. We don't look at ourselves. We look at what the pro what something's wrong with this product. And I mean, even when I was teaching for a manufacturer, I would have other educators who were doing a class and for whatever reason, their color on their model would go sideways. Mm -hmm. And they would call the office and say, did they change the formula on number six? Right. Yeah, they did. You know, last month they decided they were gonna screw with you mentally. And so they were gonna change the formula on number six and see who they made, it a, they made it a six RV. Yeah, so I just just to you, just to we, get you. We yeah, just to get you. Just really funny. Or when someone would say, "Well, I've used that, and it doesn't lighten the hair light enough for me. It, I can never get it light enough." And I'm thinking, "Well, it's only a hair. It has no brain. It doesn't right. know. <laughs> it's up to you. You know, it's obviously the mechanic side of it had nothing to do with the product side of it." So, right. so I think formulation is still a big challenge for people. Mm -hmm. um, if they're depositing, they don't have too much of a problem. If they're lifting, it's when they have a real problem, when they're lightening sure. here. So, sure. so let's talk about the first one. You were raised on this one too. Yes. Just as I was. The math equation. You take the desired level and you multiply it by two, subtract the starting level or the natural level, and that tells you what level of color to use. Right. <laughs> I love that. So what they're actually saying is whatever level of color you use with 20 volume will always lighten the hair half the distance between the hair and the level of color you use. That's all that it is. So you don't have to do, and it's so funny. <laughs> they go, I'm a hairdresser, I don't do math. And I go, really? I said, so what happens when you get to the cash register? Does your math skills get pretty good then? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. When you're math. counting your tips at the end of the day? <laughs> your math skills get really good. Yeah. So. 
you know, the, it's the couple of ways to approach it. Just, just think about that. Let's imagine that I'm a level three brunette and I want to be a level six. So I count from three to four is one, from four to five is two, from five to six is three. So now I'm going to count three more levels. Six to seven is one, seven to eight is two, eight to nine is three. So I'm going to use a level nine with 20 volume on a level three to create or to lighten the hair approximately three levels lighter. Now, some of you watching this are going, that doesn't work. You've got to have 30 volume. No, you don't. No, you don't. Exactly. <laughs> 20 volume will do fine because lifting or lightening of the hair is a combination. It has really not a lot to do with the peroxide. It has a lot to do with the marriage of the peroxide and the level of color that I use. You know, so like the level of color creates an environment. And that environment allows the peroxide to release more oxygen. So if I mix peroxide, 20 volume, with lighter levels, I get a lot of more lift than I get deposit. Right. If I mix the same 20 volume with darker shades, I get a lot more deposit than I get lift. It still works in 2021. It even works with brands that teach volume for lift. Absolutely. Because we have to remember too, the lighter the shade in a permanent hair color range, you got to think the bigger the engine. Right. So that's great. A level a level ten is going to be a Corvette. A level four is going to be a Chevette. <laughs> that's great. I love that. <laughs> you know. So it's like depending on where you want to go. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. And another, and another way that I was taught this method was that you could take the, the starting level. So let's say it was a four and you put a, you were thinking, okay, well, what if I used a level 10? Four plus 10 is 14 divided by two. I'm going to get a seven. Yes. That's the other so, reverse of where you're going to get instead of what you're going to use. So exactly. what you're going to use would be the first one where what you where you're going to end up would be the second one, right? Exactly. So so it's a way to cross check yourself. Now, here's why that works. Is that each level is not a fin finite it's not a finite measurement. A level is more of a range than it is a finite destination. Sure. So within each level, when people who build hair color, when they talk about it, we know that there's a light version of that level and there's a dark version of that level. So <clears throat> really, if I use universal law of lift, that's what this is called, universal law of lift, I'm going to get a lighter version of whatever my target level is because I'm using alkalinity to create that environment so that peroxide can release more oxygen and create a lighter visual result. So for me as a colorist, sometimes I want to end up on the light side. I want to end up on the light side because I want more reflect out of my finish or maybe I'm trying to achieve an unachievable <laughs> result. Right. Uh, you know that client, right? She says, I want to be um, ash blonde and I don't want you to, no double processing. I want to be ash blonde and I want you to just don't use bleach on my hair. See, most of us, when I say double process or two step of color, many of us, we have that image in our head. Well, he's talking about bleach, right? But I'm not. Right. You know, you know, lighter levels of color will lighten hair too. So sometimes let's imagine that, well, we talked about this a little bit ago. I'm a level four, which in my world is a medium brown. I want to be a level seven red, which in my world 
<clears throat> is called Titian red. Because in my world, red doesn't live at level seven. So it's going to be more of an orangey red. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's called Titian red. <laughs> so I want to be a level seven, but I want to be as red as I possibly can. So I use, I two-step the color. I use a 10 level color with 20 volume on my level four. I will lift it to the lighter side of a level seven. Now I can go in with my red, my red numbers, my seven level red, and I can put that on the head of hair and I can get two things will happen. Number one, I'll get the most bright, intense red you've ever seen. Number two, it will have longevity. Here's why I say this. If you were to use a level seven red with 30 volume to give you three levels of lift, you would still get close to a level seven and you would still have some red. The problem is you have something called pigment loss that people know nothing about <coughs> that occurs in every color process we do. You know, we never talk about the pigment we lose because we don't even know. Sometimes people never even told us about that. Right. But if I increase the volume of the developer, I'm actually going to lose more pigment. So by the time I get to that seven, I don't have as much pigment as I really wanted to begin with. So it might look good walking out of the salon, been in a week or so, sometimes two weeks. Their experiences in the old days, we called it roll up. <coughs> the color would roll up and you would see what you actually were left with, the, what right. the hair was contributing. And it wasn't pretty. It never is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and wouldn't you say it's a pretty safe sort of adage to adopt? the higher volume of developer you use, the more color loss you're gonna have Absolutely. in the bowl. Because you're creating more activity. Exactly, exactly. I think we talked about this on another episode that the color process is chaotic. Yeah. You know, and, and I want <clears throat> people, we're taught that it's, that it's organized. We're taught that it's sequential, but it's not. It's like, it's like, it's like a square dance for people that are on cocaine. Because <laughs> as you know, you know, when you learn, if you ever learned to square dance when you were in school, that was part of the, what they taught you as a student. Do you go to special class, social classes? You know, you have to change partners. Well, this is like, ah, everybody's working. The couplers are looking for the precursors and the modifiers and the peroxide is just going, I'm going to shatter you. I'm going to carry you in. You know, everything's going crazy. <laughs> Square dance for people on cocaine. I don't know why I said that. That was... It's, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. So, so I think that we have to take that into consideration. And sometimes we don't. So, <clears throat> you know, universal law of lift. And of course, remember the universal law of lift was originally created for working on virgin hair. So this is the first thing people will say if when you talk about this system, they'll go, don't forget that's only for virgin hair. Well, they're kind of right, but then they're not completely right. Here's why I say that alkalinity is your friend in hair color. If I take previously colored hair, let's say it colored at a level six, and I use a level eight or a level nine hair color on it, several things will happen. Number one, the alkalinity will be stronger. So the cuticle will swell. <clears throat> peroxide will break down the structure, both the natural melanin in the hair and the artificial pigment that's in the hair. They will all be broken down and the peroxide will deliver some new artificial dye intermediates to what is existing and you can literally change the color. The only exception to that 
or the only caveat would be if there was color on color on color on color, and then you wouldn't get much movement. But <clears throat> if there was very little color or if the color was old, you know, they hadn't refreshed it for a long time, or if the texture of the hair was fine, you could move that color around. You know, so, so even though we know universal law of lift is designed for virgin hair, we also know that in some color correction situations, we can take advantage of the universal law of lift because alkalinity can be our friend. Exactly. So that's and universal law of lift. What do you think? Yeah, and I just wanted to say the it, it completely does work. Yes. And you know, if you haven't tried it, you should try it for yourself. But the one downside to it is that you get excellent, precise lift. Right. But because you are using a higher level shade, right. what you're getting for deposit isn't always the best for control exactly or for when you're lifting and covering white hair exactly especially yep. if you're going beyond a level eight as your target shade right because and that's gonna... that's a fact of science yes exactly what you're saying is that <clears throat> anything lighter than a level eight we know in the industry we teach for complete great coverage you must be a level eight or deeper and even at a level eight you're walking on thin ice but yeah. you, you can't so yes, using the universal law of lift, you're not, it's really not something you're concerned about the pigment. The pigment will have some effect on the hair, uh, <clears throat> but it won't have a large effect. I'll give you an example. I'm a level three brunette. I wanna be a level six dark blonde. So I could use volume for lift with 30 volume, or I could use universal lift. If I use volume for lift with 30 volume, 30 volume disturbs more pigment than 20 volume. So by the time I get to that level six, even if I'm using a cobalt blue color, the underlying tone, what the hair is contributing is gonna be extremely bright, yeah. very high to compensate for. If I use a level nine, which is using universal law of lift, I will also get to that level six and amazingly, it really won't be as bright as the other formula where I use the 30 volume developer. Right. So those are things to keep in mind about universal law of lift. I love it. I teach it. I use it in the salon on a regular basis. So if you've never tried it, I recommend you do. Yeah. <clears throat> Take some hair that you've cut off laying on the floor you know, and uh, make a swatch out of it and test what we're telling you. Yeah. Uh, I think you'll be quite surprised. Um, I think sometimes people are so afraid of that big orange monster popping out that they're fearful to try that. And uh, I really think you should. And I think what scares people mostly is those undertone charts because they're not real. They're not real. <laughs> so, you know, those are the things they need to be aware of. Well, anything we missed on universal law of lift? I mean, I think we covered it and then some. I think we did. Uh, that's been fun. All right. So um, let's think about this. Uh, Max, is there any parting thoughts that you have for everyone as we close this one off for today? Sure. First off, if whatever you're doing is working for you, we are not here to make you change we are just here to open your mind and you know if, if you are interested in what we're saying then put it to the test do a swatch and you know let us know in the comments what you found out we'd love to hear it absolutely and and remember for us it's to give you that information and let you make that decision our whole goal is to empower you to help you discover the genius inside of yourselves. 
I want to thank all of you for watching. We encourage you, if you like what we're uh, offering and what we're giving here, here on YouTube, you can subscribe here right below the, the screen. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram. Max's Instagram handle is Max M Hair. <coughs> My Instagram handle is at Real Captain Color. You can also follow us on Facebook, which would be Guru Nation. That is our company page. And I invite you to go to our website, which is www.gurunation.net and take a look at some of the education that we offer you. You can click on the educational tab and it will give you an idea of the programs that we offer that are upcoming. Also, there is, if you click on details, then there's a little video screen. You can click on that. It gives you kind of a little preview about the content of the program and things of that sort. But uh, we are uh, we want to thank those of you that have been uh, telling us that this program has been answering a lot of questions for you and that it's making you feel better and more confident about hair color. You know, that's what it's about for us is helping our colleagues feel better uh, about what they're involved in. And remember, um, this is just one part of a two-part episode. Uh, so this is part one where we talked about universal law of lift. Uh, be sure to join us on episode the next episode where we will now discuss law, volume for lift. So then you can make that comparison. But in any case, Max, thank you so much for being with me today, my friend. As yes. always, it is great to visit with you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. And so from my heart to yours, I'm Captain Color. I'm out of here. Max, how about you? Everybody yep. take care. And this program is to be continued. See you soon. Bye.